Now, let's get down to some practical things now. Here's a graph or, or a chart uh, showing how one might fare at a, a particular game of chance. Now, what I've shown here is the solid dark line running just above the x-axis in this graph is the graph of the expectation at a particular game. Now, this would be typical if you were playing a, a biased coin flipping game. So let's say you're flipping a coin, but instead of uh, the coin being perfectly 50-50, it's slightly positive so that it maybe comes up uh, heads 51% of the time and tails 49% of the time. Let's say you win a dollar when it comes up heads and you lose a dollar when it comes up tails. So as you're playing along, the number of trials goes along the x-axis here, and your result is on the y-axis. So the expected result, that is the average or mean result of the series of trials, you can see is creeping upwards as you move along slightly. So by the end of 100 trials, you'd expect to be a couple of, uh, a couple of units ahead. But what's more important here, and what's kind of more interesting as a phenomenon, is that the uh, spread or the possible variation in your result um, is given by the blue lines first, is the one standard deviation uh, spread, and the uh, pink dotted line on the outside is the two standard deviation result. So basically this chart describes what could happen to you in a hundred trials of a, a very even coin flipping game with a narrow advantage towards the player. Your mean result is to be slightly ahead of, of even, so you would have made a little bit of money, but your actual result could very easily be anywhere within those different ranges. So you could be up up or down, we're seeing 10 or 20 units, plus or minus are quite realistic um, possibilities for where you could be after that period of time. Um, this is what people typically face. Now, if you're in a casino, it would be very much like this, except that your expectation would be a little bit negative. Instead of having a, an expected positive result after an hour's play or after 100 trials, you'd actually have a negative expected result. So this uh, you know, would be sort of a, a rotation of this graph around the x-axis with your um, probability of losing. But it would basically say that you could walk into a casino and even if you had a negative or a negative expected result, in one hour's play or 100 trials, uh, you could be anywhere. You could be winning a lot, you could be losing a lot, and that's what people typically go to a casino for. Now, what I've shown here is now the medium run. That was the short run, 100 trials. Now I've, I've showing the medium run of the same game. So this is basically the same probabilities operating except that this time I've run it out to 10,000 trials. So now what, what you see has happened here is that the, the expectation has grown much larger. We now see that we um, have an expected positive return of about 100 units. And this has shifted where the uh, standard deviation lines fall as well. Now we see that most of your probable um, uh, return is um, very much above the x-axis. So you're heading to where you'd have to be at least one standard deviation below expectation. That is where the, the blue dashed line crosses the x-axis over around the 10,000 mark. So two-thirds or most of the time you'd be winning in this particular game, or I should say more like uh, five-sixths of the time. So there'd only be results more than one standard deviation below chance would result in you being a net loser. Uh, so you're doing pretty good at this point. And let's go to an even longer run. This is... Um, the, the, the sort of the long run. Now, this is maybe 100,000 plays at a particular game. And what you're seeing is that your um, expectation, the, the thick black line, has gone up considerably. You're now expected to be 1,000 units ahead. And the two standard deviation line shows that even if you've had an extremely bad run of luck, that is, you're doing much worse than expectation, you're still bound to be ahead, basically. So you're, um, you're more or less geared to be, guaranteed to be winning at this point. So this is the, the law of large numbers uh, sort of applied to gambling in action. And basically what it's saying here is a, a, a sort of a, um, a corollary to the law of large numbers, that in a gambling game, you know, you will, your real result will eventually come very close to your expected result, or it will become, the percentage-wise, will become expected. So if you're playing an adva advantageous game with a positive edge for the player, uh, you're definitely going to win eventually, but... What's, you know, I had actually done these particular charts up for a, um, a talk about a winning gambling system. The truth of the matter is that for a typical gambler in a casino, it's just the opposite. All of these charts would be uh, just the reverse. You know, if you went in and played for an hour, you could be winning or could be losing. You'd have a small negative expected result. If you played for 100 hours, which would be roughly 
uh, 10,000 trials of, say, blackjack over in Macau or something like this, you'd be almost certainly losing, but there'd be some chance, again, this graph would be reversed, uh, there'd be about a one in six chance that is greater than one standard deviation chance that you might be ahead. But if you went to Macau and you played for 100,000 trials, which might be something like 1,000 hours of play, which a heavy gambler could do in a year, you'll certainly be behind, basically. There's almost no chance that you'll be, be ahead. So uh, that's a, a warning to people who play games with negative expectations. Now I'd like to go on to something a little bit more interesting after those uh, theoretical preliminaries, and that's the, the modern contributions of mathematicians to some unsolved gambling problems. Firstly, it, it's true that the basic problems, uh, the, the important problems, were all solved in the 17th century. There was a particular period dating from 1654 when uh, Pascal and Fermat first started working on the problem. Within about 50 years, most of the major ideas had been developed and the, the uh, machinery was in place to solve most gambling problems. Uh, however, there are occasional new theoretical developments, uh, some of which have occurred just in the last 50 years or so. But increasingly also, the computer-based mathematical techniques have now been used by gamblers and researchers to try to find winning systems at, at games that had uh, previously seemed, uh, you know, immune to such assaults. Basically, games that couldn't be beaten before, people have now found ways to do it. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is an analytic result that um, uh, was made by a gentleman named J.L. Kelly. Um, Kelly was a researcher working at the Bell Laboratories, Bell, the, of the Bell Telephone Company fame in the 1950s. And he was working on the theory of ins information transmission, but realized that uh, one of his findings could actually be applied to gambling. And what he, what he solved was the problem was what fraction of, a ca of his capital should a gambler risk on each play? And this, was, uh, this is a very practical problem. Usually if you have a, a system and you're a gambler, you also have a finite amount of capital. And that's something that is not necessarily told to you by any of the other uh, theorems that I talked about before, the expectation or the, the law of large numbers, it doesn't tell you precisely how much money you should risk on each play of the game. Um, and that's what, his, um, that's what his result told us. Uh, his result has proven to be very uh, generally, uh, generally applicable to different gambling situations and it's used very widely by professional gamblers today. Uh, what Kelly did was to define something called the uh, it's called the Kelly criterion sometimes, is he defined the exponential rate of growth of a gambler's capital, G, as being the limit of this um, X of N, which is uh, final capital versus his starting capital, uh, as a game is played on and N being the number of trials. Um, what I, I, the, the derivation and the, um, and the solution to this is a little bit involved and in, uh, beyond the scope of this lecture, but it, it gives some very simple results. So for instance, in a, a coin flipping game that where the coin was slightly biased, for instance, let's say you had a, a coin where you, uh, or a game where you win a dollar if, it comes up, if the coin comes up heads, and you lose a dollar if it comes up tails, but instead of the coin being 50-50, it's actually uh, has a 0.51 probability of heads and a 0.49 probability of tails. So that'd be a slightly advantageous game. And let's say you have uh, $1,000 as your total capital. Well. The Kelly formula, maximizing that uh, function G as, as above as uh, uh, according to the fraction of your capital that you wager on each play, uh, it comes to a very simple formula, which is you should wager 2 times P, and P being the probability of winning, 2 times P minus 1. So if P is 0.51, uh, you would want to uh, wager 0.02 of your capital. So if you had $10,000, you'd want to risk $20 on each play or $20 on the first play, I should say, but then always recalculating as your capital grew or shrank, depending on whether you're winning or losing, you would always outlay exactly 0.02 or 2% of your capital. It's a very important result and it's used very widely. Uh, the second uh, big area is not, a, uh, is not a theoretical advance, but rather it's a practical advance in gambling. Uh, I think uh, many of you will know the game of blackjack. Uh, to those who don't, um, I'm really not going to be able to describe it here adequately, but I'll assume that most of you do. Uh, that's a game where the player receives two cards and the dealer receives one card uh, which is visible to the player and another card which is hidden. Now the object of the game is to achieve a point total 